Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through Colossians. In Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul has been describing what it means that our lives are hidden in Christ. When the Spirit of Christ comes and dwells in us, then our old self-absorbed way of living begins to fall off like an old set of stinky, rotten clothing. And we begin to put on Christ and His character and His nature uh, like a new set of clothes. And that's what the imagery that Paul uses is, put on Christ. And in putting on Christ, we put on His compassion. We put on His kindness, His humility, meekness, long-suffering, forgiving one another especially the love of Christ that chooses for the highest good. Now, big things can come in small packages. Uh, For instance, you can receive a $10,000 gift certificate in a very tiny envelope. Uh, In the three verses we shall cover today, which are very short, they're just a fraction of Paul's letter to Colossae, uh, though it's a tiny part, it carries a great big message in it. Uh, and it uh, has a dynamic application, actually, for a believer's daily life and for the body of Christ. These verses contain five exhortations that if we could use them for a daily roadmap, our lives would be incredibly changed and transformed and blessed. Uh, rather than these things just emerging throughout our walk with the Lord, where Christ emerges, His life emerges in us, Though, uh, Paul indicates here that we have the freedom to choose, to make choices that will help us to make the most of our lives in Christ. So, you know, at some point we're on a bubble, kind of, about some of these things where we can say, well, no, I'm not going to do that, or I am going to do that, and, that's, uh, and God never forces anything on us, does He? He doesn't make us do anything, but He invites us uh, to draw from Him and to follow his way. So let's look at verse 15 at the first exhortation we see here. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Now, this is a most important exhortation. I think it's one of the most important exhortations that the Apostle Paul gives in his writings. Uh, Letting the peace of God rule in your hearts, What that does is that leads us into opportunities that the Lord has for us uh, and will assist us also in not making choices that we will later regret. Any of you ever made some choices you later regretted and as you look back on it, you realize you didn't have the peace of God when you made those choices. Uh, God didn't give you the green light, but you did it anyways. And so I've done that a number of times, I have to confess to you, Uh, but we later regret those choices. So we need to make choices that are coming out of the peace of God within us. So let's take a look at, at what, the, what is the peace of God. Well, uh, it's not the same thing as peace with God. Those are two different things. Peace with God, and then you have the peace of God. Uh, so before we confess Jesus Christ as Lord uh, and place our faith in the gospel of grace, we do not have peace with God, Okay. Uh, There's a conflict with God because of the guilt and the rule of sin in our lives. It separates us from God. And and so God's law then condemns us because of our sin. But just as we studied in chapter 2, that condemnation was wiped out at the cross of Calvary where Jesus gave his life and laid down his life for the atonement of our sins so that our guilt of sin could be washed away and expunged from the records. Uh, And so we have faith in the truth that we are justified, meaning that the record of our sin is erased. Because of that, there is no more conflict between us and God. And we have peace with God. And it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, peace with God, you see, is a positional thing. It's not an emotional thing. It's not uh, something that you feel, okay? It's, it's not uh, one of those kinds of things. It's not a, a heartfelt thing. It's actually a positional thing uh, where it's uh, rather than a state of mind and spirit and emotions. Uh, there are people who struggle to have the peace of God uh, because of uncertainty that they have peace with God, though. Sometimes when they have self-doubt 
about whether they have peace with God. They can't seem to also uh, take possession of the peace of God. Um, but uh, that uncertainty. One of my favorite stories to illustrate uh, this is about a Japanese soldier in World War II. The war in the Pacific ended on September the 2nd, 1945, but many of the Japanese soldiers on the Pacific Islands had not gotten word that the war had ended. And so they kept hiding and being prepared to fight for a long time. And, uh, and one Japanese lieutenant was named Onada, and he did not get the word, though he did see some leaflets that had been dropped on the island there, but he thought it was just propaganda. So he kept prepared to fight. And he hid in caves and lived off the land, and he kept his rifle ready to engage the enemy, uh, this non-existent enemy, for, for all that time, 29 years. Lieutenant Onada hid in caves and kept his rifle ready to fight the enemy. And there was no conflict. There was no war to fight. And so, guys, if we, will put our tr- if we put our trust in that Jesus took care of that on the cross, we don't have to stay prepared to fight that we're not in conflict with God, you know. The conflict is ended. And so we have peace with God. Uh, but some of us find it difficult to accept God, God's grace at face value. Uh, the good news just seems too good to be true. You know, we look at what we've done, the guilt of our sin, how we failed in life, and, and we think, you know, there's, there's no way God could, could just wipe that out with one act of Christ on the cross. How could that be? Grace sometimes is hard to embrace, you know, but we do that, uh, embrace it, and it's reality, it's true. The peace of God is an awareness of God's presence, giving a sense of harmony and rest within our souls. And this does have to do not with position with God. It's not a positional thing, but it does have to do with an inner awareness, a sense of our mind, a state of our emotions and our human spirits, our souls. It's an intuitive awareness that we are on the same page with God uh, about issues in our lives and our relationships. Uh, it des- it's, it's described with words like inner rest or contentment, uh, the absence of anxiety. Someone described it, and I like this uh, description of the peace of God, as inner equilibrium. Inner equilibrium. Uh, Paul tells us that the peace of God happens in our hearts. Now, The word heart in Scripture not only describes that physical organ that's beating in your chest right now and is keeping you physically alive, uh, it's it's also that inner part of us where we feel things, where we feel happiness, where we feel despair, where we feel uh, experience intuition. There's somehow that we're aware, we know something, we say, well, where's that coming from? You know, it's, it's not really up here, is it? But it's somehow it's down in here someplace. You can't really describe it, but it's the heart that the Scripture is referring to. And, and uh, it's, it's where we experience despair. It's where we experience motivation. We speak of being lighthearted. We speak of being, uh, having a heaviness of heart, you know, when we're grieving. Uh, we use the expression of being heartbroken, you know, uh, or having a glad heart, a joyful heart. In Scripture, it also refers to that indescribable place where we commune with God. There's a spiritual communion that takes place between us and God in our hearts, um, and uh, which reaches you know, down inside of us, somewhere where we have that closeness with God, and we converse with God, and uh, we know God. It, it's also where His Spirit dwells. Uh, the Holy Spirit fills us. Where does He fill us? He fills our hearts. And uh, Paul in Romans chapter 5 said that the Holy Spirit has, has uh, the, the Lord has poured out the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Okay, that's where the Holy, the Holy Spirit dwells. And so that's where we understand spiritual truth. We don't understand spiritual truth as much up here at first until it, is, it begins to come alive in our hearts. And then our mind somehow is able to wrap around that truth because it's in our hearts, and as well as we are able to discern evil spirits. In our hearts, there's that spiritual discernment that can take place, or that which is not from God. And we have that sense of awareness that this is not from the Lord. Uh, Now, with our minds, we think of many things, 
but that which reaches the heart becomes embedded there and it overflows from our hearts. Now, the heart can also be filled with things that are not of the Lord, you know, and instead of the Lord. Uh, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So sometimes you're, you can become aware of what's really in your heart based upon what your mouth is speaking or whatever, you know, what's coming out. It's coming out of your heart. An anxious heart will speak about worry uh, and negative things. Uh, an angry heart will be critical and argumentative. Uh, when peace rules in our hearts, uh, Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. So when peace rules in our hearts, it's used like we think of as an umpire or an ar- arbitrator. The, the peace of God is like a referee within our hearts. And, and Bill Earl, you know, sometimes works as a soccer referee. And uh, as long, sometimes if you'll hang out for long enough after service, you'll see Bill burst through the door of the office in his soccer referee uniform, you know. And it's kind of cool. It's kind of amazing, uh, you know. But uh, it's, it's different, you know. Oh, it's, it's like Superman has come out the door or something, you know. And, uh, uh, you, you know, when, when Bill is refereeing a soccer game, as long as things are going according to the rules, Bill is real quiet, you know. He's just running back and forth on the field. But a, a violation on the soccer field will bring out his whistle, and things aren't so quiet anymore, you know. Bill will explain the violation, and the players begin to protest. No, I didn't do that. That's not right, you know. And then the, the coaches say, yeah, that's not right. Why you, you, blah, 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 you know, and. And, uh, and then they may even yell at the players, too. Why did you do that? You know, don't you want to win this game? And then the parents. <laughs> the most treacherous part of a referee's life in the youth sports leagues is the parents. I know. I used to be one of those parents. I have a friend that many years ago, his son was a, an amazing basketball player in high school around here. And, and so he invited me to go to a game with me, and we sat there watching the game, and boy, I wanted to crawl underneath the bench every now and then because those poor referees, he was merciless toward them, and he had a very loud, booming voice, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm not really with him, you know. <laughs> you know, but it, it wasn't quiet. It wasn't peaceful. But, you know, if everybody wants to continue the game, on that soccer field, they will let Bill make his ruling without dispute. They'll let Bill rule. Then peace prevails again. And so you, that's the way peace is. Peace is that referee within our hearts. The point is that the peace of God sort of acts like that referee. And so when we are making a choice that is in the will of God, there will be a quietness in our spirits, in our hearts. There'll be a type of rest. Nobody's making a lot of noise. With Nothing's making a lot of noise within us. And there's a sense of spiritual and emotional rest going on. But when we are moving away from the will of God, there will be internal restlessness and discontent. And the peace of God blows its whistle within us. And we might even start arguing, you know, and all kinds of things with the peace of God. But, uh, you know, we have this vacuum cleaner at home that has some kind of sensory, I don't know where it is or how it works, but when I'm helping Vicky with the vacuuming, you know, uh, when that red, that little sensory light on the front of it is red, I know I've got to stay in that spot until it turns green, you know. When it turns green, I can move on again. And that's kind of the way the peace of God works within us. It's a sensory type of thing within us. You know, when, when it's not appropriate to move on, you know, we've got something to work on, the, the, the peace of God's going to be like that red light. You know, we've got some work to do within our spirits, within our souls about something. But then the, when the peace of God leads us to that point of rest in Him, we have that sense of harmony with God. And we're on the same page with the Lord. Then it's kind of like that green light coming on. We can move on with things. It's best to understand... When the interior of our hearts is disturbed, it may mean that we need to take a longer look at something before we jump into making a decision. God sees the big picture. We cannot see it. He sees, 
like in Montana, you know, big sky country. You can see forever and ever out there. I love it. And uh, peace of God, because of what God can see, is that warning signal that our perceptions are not quite right when we're disturbed within ourselves. It's best to slow down and reconsider things. Hasty decisions now will often lead to things in the future that we regret and things that will grieve us. Uh, I would encourage all of us not to make any decisions about anything until peace is restored to our hearts. Because until peace is restored to our hearts, we've got some homework to do. Okay? So don't rush into things when your spirit is disturbed, when your soul is uneasy on the inside. Disturbance of the peace of God could also be a signal that we have some attitude issues or some subtle sins to deal with within our lives. Uh, in Ephesians 4.30, Paul, I think, essentially describes the lack of peace with God as the grieving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, we lose our, that peace within us. And, and he says in, in, in Ephesians 4.30... He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So this may in fact be the most common reason why people have a loss of peace within their hearts. Festering anger, speaking in hurtful ways about others, and clamor, which is magnifying or exaggerating an issue. My mother told to me like this, Jerry, you're making a mountain out of a mohill, you know. And uh, sometimes my wife, if she's talking with somebody and, and she realizes they're, they're exaggerating their feelings about something and just blowing something way up, she's, she'll say, are you sure this is the hill you want to die on, you know. <laughs> sometimes it's a real little hill, you know. If you're going to die on a hill, make it a big mountain, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, exaggerating issues, these are things that grieve the presence of Christ within us and cause an internal loss of rest in our souls. Now, Paul writes that we need to put away those things. We need to remove them from our hearts, resolve them. Now, peace ruling in our hearts is also the presence of God calming our hearts in the middle of a crisis or a time of trouble. Now, this is a, a, a different kind of different view of the same issue Peace ruling in our hearts is the presence of God calming us down. We go through storms in life. We go through things that shake our world. Well, the peace of God is a supernatural gift from God to help calm us down during a storm, during a crisis. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, there is a special gift of peace, you see, that transcends our crisis and our storm or our disappointment in life. It seems that the presence of Christ within us is within us to give us an internal equilibrium when everything else is shaking. There's an internal steadiness, steadfastness that can occur within us when everything around us is falling apart. We're not falling apart because of the presence of Christ and his peace within us, okay? So now Jesus told his disciples that this kind of peace is a gift from him. And he let not, to, you know, it, it's, it's something that we, like anything else that God offers, which is by grace, God gives us opportunities. Our salvation is by grace. It's a gift of grace. We can reject it or accept it. The same thing is true of the peace of Christ. You know, when he offers us that peace, He's willing to lead us into that, that place of peace and rest in our souls, but we stubbornly sometimes say, well, no, I'm not ready for that peace yet. I've got some things I, I want to stay angry for a while or I want to stay upset for a while. You know, this is not fair, you know, and, and I've got to, you know, I just want to just feel bad for a while. Doesn't make sense, does it? But he offers us his grace. Like any other gift, we can accept it or refuse it. The word let, as in let the peace of God rule in your heart, or let not your hearts be troubled, indicate that we have a choice in this manner of internal 
equilibrium. Sometimes I find myself stubbornly holding on to something that keeps me feeling troubled. You know, I want to just chew on it for a while. I want to ruminate on it for a while. You know, I want to, uh, you know, be anxious for a while and tell everybody how anxious I am for a while and uh, be angry for a while. You know, Jesus was angry, but he wasn't angry for a while. He let go of his anger almost immediately, <laughs> you know. And, and, to, uh, and so we get stuck with our hearts full of complaints, you know, or blaming or predictions of failure, you know. You ever been around somebody who's stuck on that? You know, you got all these amazing ideas coming into your mind and somebody keeps saying, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. I've tried that. That doesn't work, you know. Stuck. We think, well, what if this happens? Or, or what if that happens? Almost disabling our hearts to the point that the very thing that we fear will come upon us. It's like it's, they used to say in sociology class when I was in college, self-fulfilling prophecy, you know. What we think is going to happen winds up happening, you know. Uh, the way we think about life. Just like those soccer players and parents who have lost their peace and are protesting the referee's calls, we stubbornly refuse to accept the correction that the Spirit of God is seeking to make in our hearts. Peace of God should be something that we're all wanting very much in our hearts. It's an umpire. It's a guardian of our hearts. Uh, and to keep our spiritual and emotional equilibrium in place. In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says exactly this. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And now listen to verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now Paul tells us here that prayer, is the primary means for bringing our hearts and our minds under the guardianship of the peace of God. Prayer is perhaps the most significant tool that we have in letting, making the choice, to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Now, prayer is having a conversation with God. It is where we are free to inquire of the Lord. The psalmist said that a number of times, didn't he? He says, I inquired of the Lord. David said that. Uh, oftentimes it says, and David inquired of the Lord, you know. Uh, inquiring of the Lord. To seek his perspective that is better than our own. In fact, one, one thing that I would really encourage is something I've, I've done, learned to do quite a bit when I'm disturbed on the inside. I so, said, I don't know, sometimes I'm not even sure what it is, you know, it's disturbing me. And I'll pray and I'll say, okay, Lord, I don't know what this is, but I'm real disturbed on the inside. And I'll just say to the Father in heaven, what is that? You know what's going on, what is it? Tell me what it is. Not too awfully long ago, I was disturbed for two or three days in a row. I mean, just terribly disturbed on the inside. I mean, I thought there was something going crazy inside of me. And finally, I asked, I waited. I wish I hadn't waited so long. And I went to the Father and said, okay, what is this? <laughs> because I couldn't think of a single reason why I was feeling that way. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is spiritual warfare you're going through. And you need to exercise what you know about doing spiritual warfare. And so I began to do that, and sure enough, the peace of God came floating back, took charge of that situation. We need to see things, understand that God sees a lot more than we do, and that's why we go to him in prayer. We talk to him about what we're feeling, what we're experiencing on the inside. Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson said, Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. I don't know how you do it, but here's what I do. I just say, okay, Heavenly Father, 
Um, this is what's on my mind. This is what I'm thinking about. These are my questions. And I get real specific. And I tell God exactly what I'm thinking. Then I'll say, okay, what do you think about that? Then I listen for his voice. And sometimes his voice will come instantly to me. I like it when it does that. I'm American, you know, like instant things, you know. But other times, it may be several days, and I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden the answer comes. The Holy Spirit, a still, small voice of the Lord will speak. I'll go, wow, why didn't I think of that before? It comes from him. It comes through him. Uh, Ask questions. Wait and listen. Psalm 130, verse 5 and 6 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Do you see the picture here? The psalmist is probably awake in the middle of the night thinking anxious thoughts or perhaps angry thoughts or despairing thoughts. And he has learned that better than just longing for the daylight to come. Have you ever done that? You wake up in the middle of the night and you start thinking anxious thoughts or difficult things and, and you're going, what time is it? Oh, it's 3.30. When's daylight come? You know, when I can get up and get the coffee and forget about this, get on with my day. And you wind up just waiting and waiting. Finally, 30 minutes before it's time to get up, you go to sleep, you know. He says, better, the psalmist says, better, better than that, better than just waiting for the morning to dawn. Yeah, it's better to wait on the Lord. Go before him, listen for his voice, reach out to him. When I hear the voice of the Lord speaking to my heart, it calms me down. How about you? It may even instruct me or correct me about something that I am doing to disturb the peace of God in my heart. Someone said a man prayed, and the first, at first he thought that prayer was talking, but he became more and more quiet until, in the end, he realized that prayer is listening. It's listening, meditating, listening for the Lord. Now, the second exhortation in Colossians 3, 15 through 17 is intrinsically tied to the first. Letting the peace of God rule in your hearts, our hearts, is facilitated by this second imperative. And be thankful. It literally says, keep on being thankful. In other words, don't ever stop being grateful. Don't ever stop being thankful. When we stop being thankful, the peace of God is more easily interrupted by the cares of life. And so that's like fuel in our tank, thankfulness is. Gratefulness is like fuel to our hearts and the peace of God in our hearts. Thankfulness overcomes discouragement. There's a legend of a man who found the barn where Satan kept his seeds. Uh, They were being kept there ready to be sown in human hearts. And on finding the seeds of discouragement more numerous than others, he learned that those seeds could be made to grow almost anywhere in anyone's heart except for one. Satan reluctantly admitted that there was one place that he could never get them to thrive, the seeds of discouragement. Where is that, asked the man. Satan replied sadly, in the heart of a grateful man. In the heart of a grateful person, the seeds of discouragement do not thrive. Helen Keller, most of us know, was stricken with deafness and blindness at the age of 19 months. She became such an amazing, amazing person the face of the earth has ever known. And she said one day, I thank God for my handicaps, for through them I have found myself, my work, and my God. So much has been given to me, I have no time to ponder over that which has been denied. So her heart was so filled with thanksgiving for what God had done for her and in her, around her, that she had no time to think about her handicap. 
In her book, The Hiding Place, Cory Den Boom tells an incident that taught her the principle of giving thanks in all things. It was during World War II, and Cory and her sister Betsy had been harboring Jewish people in their home, and uh, so that they finally were arrested and imprisoned at Ravensbrück uh, camp. And the barracks that they stayed in were extremely crowded and infested with fleas, especially the one they were in. One morning, they read in their Bible, 1 Thessalonians, the, the reminder to rejoice in all things and give thanks in all things. And, and Betsy said, Corey, we've got to give thanks for these barracks and even for these fleas. Well, Corey replied, no way am I going to thank God for the fleas. But Betsy was persuasive, and they did thank God even for the fleas. During the months that followed, they discovered that their barracks were literally left alone by all the guards who were constantly harassing the prisoners, but they didn't even come into their barracks to harass them. It was their only place of refuge uh, to get along with the Lord. They were able to have Bible studies and prayer meetings and, and share their faith with others in the barracks and all this. And then they finally discovered that the reason that the guards had left them alone was because of those blasted fleas. You know, So the fleas were a blessing in disguise. The giving of thanks reminds us of the faithfulness of God. He keeps us from being overwhelmed with anxiety when times are tough. Now, in verse 16, we hear the next two exhortations that will help us follow the roadmap that God has for our lives in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, the scripture is a wonderful gift from God, isn't it? The Word of God is full of road markers that help keep us on course. And in this exhortation, Paul specifically focuses on what he calls the Word of Christ. The Word of Christ, uh, one of the things that means is the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace. But it's also the words that Jesus spoke when he did his teaching. Uh, it, it's, it's the words that Jesus spoke and, and the Scripture speaks, that Jesus is recorded in the Scripture that Jesus spoke, and also the Scriptures about Jesus uh, he said, let these words dwell in you richly. Now, what that means is that let it just overflow in your, in your hearts. Let it build up there. Uh, so we have the wonderful teachings and exhortations of Jesus all through the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and uh, why can we trust the words of Jesus? Well, because Jesus is the Lord. He can't lie. He tells the truth about all things. So we can trust in him. His words are clear and true, right from the heart and mind of God. I strongly encourage all of us to become familiar with the words, the teaching and exhortations of Jesus. His teaching is about how the kingdom of God operates. And if we don't know his teaching, how will we know how to live in the kingdom? You know, what the kingdom of God is all about. So... I especially encourage the study and applications of the teaching of Jesus and what we call the Sermon on the Mount because I think that's kind of a summary of this kingdom teaching. Really, the whole of Scripture points to Christ. Uh, many years ago, somebody told me when they were talking about how to interpret the Scripture, they said, if you want to understand the Bible, look for Jesus because Jesus is there all through the Scriptures, throughout the Bible, Old, Old Testament and New Testament. If you want to understand the Bible, look for Jesus. Paul tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now, this means in great abundance. Load up. Load up on the word of God. Read the Bible. Do personal Bible study. As we study, a good formula to follow is to do observation, interpretation, and application Ask who, what, when, and where is involved in what you're reading. Uh, so ask yourself the question, what does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about Christ? What does this tell me about the kingdom of God? And then finally, how does this apply to me? That's a good way to do Bible study. Listen to teaching from the Bible. We are so blessed in this country. There's so much Bible study available to us. Good, great Bible teaching available to us. Great commentaries on, on the Bible to help us see behind the scenes. We, we can listen to great teaching on CDs. We can listen to it on the Internet. Uh, we have a CD table that has been provided to you f 
free of charge for you to pick up good teaching CDs from some of the other Calvary pastors. Uh, and you can get that and, and be blessed. Uh, the word of Christ is important, guys. And Paul says to let it dwell in us in all wisdom, not just richly in abundance. Don't, don't just load up on knowledge. Boy, I've known so many people who are full of knowledge. Man, they knew, they knew the Bible, you know. But they didn't have much wisdom. You know, they didn't know how to apply the knowledge they had. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. And so in all wisdom as, as well, we see. Um, it's one thing to have the knowledge of Scripture, but also important to access the wisdom of God and making application of it to our lives. James wrote that anyone who sincerely asks God for wisdom would receive it in generous proportions. You know, God will give it to you if you'll ask. I believe that may be one of the main things that Jesus was talking about when he said, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. If you need to know something, if you need to understand something about God, about the kingdom of God, ask. You'll receive the wisdom. But, you know, what we do is we go around asking everybody else. <laughs> you know, and, and we get a lot of advice. Now, I, I'm old enough now to where I've heard Tons and tons of opinions about things and advice. And now we've got the blogging going on, you know. Man, you can get all kinds of bloggers telling you how to think. Well, you need to go to God and say, Lord, how do you want me to think? How do you want me to think? Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're reminded of Yogi Berra, the Hall of Fame Yankee pitcher, who, whose head-scratching advice is also famous, earning him eight entries into the Bartlett's familiar quotations. Here's five of those quotations that he, he shared with the graduating class one time at Montclair University. Uh, he says, first, never give up because it ain't over till it's over. That's the most famous one he said, probably. Second, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Third, don't follow the crowd. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Now, that's pretty true at times, I tell you. Fourth, stay alert. You can observe a lot just by watching. Fifth and last, remember that whatever you do in your life, 90% of it is half mental. Okay. Now you understand what's important to hide the Word of God in our hearts, the wisdom of God. The advice or opinions of others needs to be scrutinized through the filter of God's Word and His wisdom as well as the arbitration of the peace of God. You know, there's a lot of folk out there who lead you astray if you're not careful. Um, listen, whatever situation you're in, God has wise counsel to give you. His counsel will not come, James writes, though, unless we ask with sincere faith. Now, I think what that means is that you ask with the attitude that what you guide me in, Lord, what you tell me, what wisdom you give me, I'm going to obey that. But if we go to him, we're double-minded. We say, well, if I like what he tells me, if it makes me feel good, you know, if it's what I want to do, <laughs> if I, it gives me confirmation, you know. One of the worst things I ever did was have a big decision one time that I was trying to make, and I, I found all these confirmations. Man, I had a list of mile-long confirmations. I got confirmation here, confirmation here, you know, blah, blah, blah. Only to discover that it was a very bad choice. You know, be careful about looking for all these confirmations everywhere. The confirmation you need is the peace of God ruling in your heart, the wisdom of God ruling in your heart. Be filled with the wisdom of Christ. Fourth exhortation, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, Paul places this exhortation in the context of our relationships with one another in the body of Christ. In other words, it's very important for us to be speaking to one another and singing with one another uh, as we gather. 
Um, this is very similar to what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 when he wrote that we are to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, in Colossians, he adds uh, teaching and admonishing one another. Now, this is also a continuation of the previous exhortation of the indwelling Word of Christ and the wise application of it. Uh, when somebody has been loaded up on, on knowledge, knowledge of God's Word, and they have the wisdom of God to go along with it, then they're able to speak to others, you know, in a way that's helpful uh, in teaching others. So uh, they are able to make wise application in the lives of others. Now, we need to be filled with the Word of Christ and the riches of His wise counsel in order to assist one another by mentoring and admonishing. Admonishing means to gently correct wrong thinking about things. Uh, and, uh, it is, it, and then he says it's to be done with grace in our hearts. That whatever we do, whatever we speak, is to be done with grace in our hearts. Uh, graciousness. Kindness, gentleness, the meekness of Christ. We're not to beat people over the head with the Word of God. You know, we're not to walk up to him and say, well, this is what the Bible says, and slap him by the side of the head and say, did you hear that? You know, you see what you've done wrong? No. They're probably going to say, get me out of here. You know, you've got to do it with the graciousness and the grace of Christ uh, when you do it. Uh, with grace in our hearts. In Colossae, this was especially important in assisting young believers who were coming under the influence of false teaching in this Colossian heresy that was in the church. And so these young Christians, they needed somebody who could graciously sit down with them and say, let me tell you what's going on here. Let me show you in God's Word. You know, let me tell you what Paul taught about this, you know, and uh, what Paul is teaching us and uh, what God is saying here. Now, throughout the New Testament epistles, Mature believers are encouraged to teach those who are young in the Lord. And this is not necessarily just in a gathering of people. I think a lot of teaching goes on one-on-one. -on -one. It's a mentoring kind of thing. We're to mentor one another uh, in the Lord. And uh, it can be lived out through this mentoring ministry. It happens a lot in small groups as well, such as home fellowship groups. Women's and men's Bible studies and youth groups and discipleship groups, support groups. And one of my favorites that I've been a part of for many years, the men's breakfast at Cracker Barrel on Friday morning. You know, I'm sitting there, we're going through Proverbs for the fourth or fifth time, you know, and, and uh, some of it's finally getting through, you know, after four or five times. And, and uh you know, I'm sitting there, and some guy at the table will say something that just blows me away. I'm going, wow. You know, wow. That is what I need to hear today. You know. And it happens as we get together. Paul emphasizes the value of singing here. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, you haven't heard me sing, have you? You know. Well, you know, with the amplification of what's going on here in the stage and we, we want to hear, I love hearing people in the congregation singing, but your voice is going to blend in with everybody else's. Don't worry about it. Just sing unto the Lord. You know, it's a blessing. The scripture is not specific as to the meaning here of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but it's largely thought that the church, the early church, sang a lot of the Old Testament psalms when they gathered together. And they're great. In fact, you know, I, I thank the Lord for back in the day for Maranatha music and all these musicians that began to sing the scripture, you know. Scripture songs. Now, most of them are very simple songs, but boy, you can't, you can't go wrong singing the Scripture. You know, it's a blessing. And uh, singing God's Word to one another. Uh, and then if you read through the New Testament epistles, you'll actually run across several New Testament hymns that are recorded there and that the church likely sang when they get, got together, perhaps especially at communion time, at the, when they shared the agape feast together. Uh, and, uh, and then there are spiritual songs that are thought to have been more sponta spontaneous as different people would sing from their hearts to the Lord during worship. Now, I encourage all of us to enjoy the exhortations and words of our worship songs. We have skilled musicians who can play the music and 
We're thankful for them. They make a joyful noise unto the Lord with that. But I hope you play, pay close attention to the lyrics of the songs. You know, not just the beat or the, you know, the instrumentation or the tune itself, but the lyrics. Because they speak to us. And uh, they remind us of what the scripture says and remind us of who God is to us and what Christ has done for us. Especially as, as I've, at this stage of my life, I have to tell you that the lyrics are probably more special to me than any other part of the worship. You know, what those songs are saying to me and how they're uplifting my heart. I often find myself singing these songs at home. You know, walking around the house just singing. And, uh, you know, they say that if you've been married long enough, you and your wife are going to wind up, you know, kind of, I don't know if you look alike or not, but you kind of act alike. And, and the, I cannot tell you how often that Vicki and I wind up singing the same song from different ends of the house, <laughs> you know. And we'll just laugh about that, you know. It's a song in our hearts, a song of the Lord. The fifth exhortation, got to hurry here. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Paul exhorts us to speak in the name of the Lord. And this means to speak as Jesus would speak. We ask ourselves the question, do my words reveal the character of Christ and the nature of Jesus? And it's not just about the content either. It's a manner in which we speak. Do we sound like Jesus when we speak? Paul exhorts that all our deeds be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory. This means the very nature and the character and ministry of Christ are to be reflected in our lifestyles. A few years ago, everybody was wearing these bracelets, WWJD. What does it mean? What would Jesus do? Stands that for that. And that phrase was popularized from a book called uh, In His Steps, written by a pastor in the late 1800s named Charles Sheldon. Uh, and so it's about a church and community that was absolutely transformed because everybody started asking that question, what would Jesus do? And they made their choices in life, especially about the social needs of the community and the poor and all that sort of thing. And, and what people didn't know is that Charles Sheldon had been living this out for many years before that book was written and published. In 1889, he moved to Topeka, Kansas, the pastor of church, announcing that he was going to preach about Christ for the common man. A Christ who belongs to the rich and the poor, the ignorant and the learned, the old and the young, the good and the bad. A Christ who bids us all recognize the brotherhood of the race, who bids us throw open this room, church gathering, to all who would come. During this time of great depression and unemployment, Charles Sheldon went out and he put on a set of old clothes and went out looking for a job, even though he already had one. He wanted to experience what the unemployed were experiencing. And sure enough, one after another, he got turned down for a job. After, you know, he didn't, couldn't find a job. So he felt what they were feeling. Heard about a guy recently had applied for 6,000 jobs, been turned down for all of them. And so he experienced that, and he wound up working at the rail yard, shoveling snow, and for no pay. Uh, and they found him in streetcars, worked working alongside streetcar operators, attending classes with college students, traveling on freight trains with rail workers, attending court with lawyers, going on rounds with doctors, working with businessmen. Perhaps the most moving experience was one that awakened Sheldon to the ugly reality of racism. He spent three weeks visiting black Americans in a, a little village or out on the outskirts of Topeka called Tennessee Town. It was made up of freed slaves and their children. And it was there that he launched an innovation that would affect not only his own community and his church, but the nation as well. It was when kindergarten started. In 1893, with the help of his parishioners, Sheldon started two kindergartens, one at his church and one in Tennessee Town. The first black kindergarten west of the Mississippi River was started in Tennessee Town by Charles Sheldon. And then he started a school, a training center for kindergarten teachers. And some of the graduates of his, of his kindergarten in Tennessee Town, one of them was Elisha Scott, who became a lawyer. 
Sheldon helped him go to law school. He became a respected Topeka attorney. And his son was Charles Sheldon Scott, who in 1954 argued the winning side of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka school desegregation case before the U.S. Supreme Court, the landmark decision. In 1897, the central church that he pastored had this training school, and eventually the graduates were eagerly hired by kindergartens all over the country. In his steps began as a series of sermons in his church. In advance, a weekly religious publication began publishing it chapter by chapter, and in 1897, it published it as a book, and the sales skyrocketed. Over the years, in his steps, appeared in millions of copies of newspapers, comic books, magazines, was translated into scores of different languages, and produced in countless plays. It is thought to be the 10th most read book in the publishing history. Sheldon gave all of his royalties to charity. Here's an example of what can happen through one person who decided that everything he spoke and everything he did was according to the name and character and the nature of Jesus. So you, you see clearly that big things do come in small packages. In these five brief exhortations in Colossians chapter 3, there's a succinct roadmap for a fruitful life in Christ. What are they? Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in your heart. Teach and admonish one another, along with singing to the Lord. Speak your words and do your deeds all in the name of Christ. This morning, it would be good if we could all rededicate our hearts to live out these exhortations, to make the choice to live this way and watch the life of Christ emerge in all we say and all we do. Let's stand together. Oh, Father, we come to you today recognizing, even while we've gone through this, how much we need this roadmap to be followed in our lives and in our fellowship, in our community, in our nation. Today we recognize also, Lord, that it begins with each and every one of us personally. And as we, as that newfound expression goes, as we begin to pay that forward into the lives of others, then just like in his steps, the transformation in that church in that community, in that region of the country, it catches on. I pray for each and every person who's gathered here today, Lord, that as they look in, as we all look into our hearts and we say, am, am I, do I have the peace of God right now? That we'd be able to risk asking you questions about that. Say, Lord, I don't have peace. I don't, I feel uneasy. I feel restless. Um, I have anxious thoughts, angry thoughts in my heart. I have issues there that I know are disturbing the peace of God. And the whistle's being blown. So, Lord, help me to understand the path I need to follow to bring that sense of harmony and inner equilibrium back into my heart. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.